Hello, good evening, and welcome. I'm John Lazarus with Stories Matter and DE Publishing. In this edition of the Great American Read Through, we'll be taking a glimpse at William Hill Brown's seminal masterpiece, The Power of Sympathy or The Triumph of Nature. But first, a word from our sponsor. Today's video is brought to you by Fish. Whether filling up our dinner plates or providing a distraction in a dentist's waiting room when our phone's being weird, fish are a welcome addition to our lives. Big, tiny, Adorable, beautiful, deadly, meek, or arrogant, there's a fish for every kind of person. You can find fish in your local supermarket, pet shop, pond, river, or coral reef. Though, probably not those last three, actually. First off, I have to admit that I made a mistake. In my first video in this series, where we looked at Beowulf, I erroneously claimed that I was unable to discuss and share works newer than 950 years old due to copyright issues. Um, I now realize that I had read uh, it wrong, and it's actually 95 years. So any book written before 1928 is fair game for this series. However, for today's segment, we're going to go back a bit farther to the year 1789. 1789 was a tumultuous time for the fledgling nation. It had been a mere six years since the end of the Revolutionary War, and after all the violence and the horror, brother fighting brother, many wondered if the ends justified the means. The invention of the cotton gin was still five years away, which meant slave owners were still struggling to make ends meet. But there was also a great optimism brewing in the nation. The newly invented guillotine promised to make executions clean, painless, and effective. The hot air balloon gave rich people a new vantage point from which to look down upon the huddled masses. And the Enlightenment was bringing rationalism and scientific progress to all people who were landed male and white. Brown's The Power of Sympathy is often considered the first American novel, mostly because it was published one day after the ratification of the U.S. Constitution. And while historians will point out its themes tie more closely to the Articles of Confederation era in which it was written, it nonetheless holds the title of first American novel and is a great way to get this series started. The book has a lot of the hallmarks that define great American literature wood chopping, incest, suicide, rational thinking, and tuberculosis. You can see echoes of Brown's work in a ride wide, from a wide range of authors, from Ralph Waldo Emerson to Walt Whitman to Edith Wharton to Stephen King to Dean Koontz to Nicholas Sparks to R.L. Stein to William Forrester. Some other fun facts about The Power of Sympathy. It is uh, considered what is considered an epistolary novel, which means it was originally intended only for adherence to the epistolary in sect of Christianity. Brown was only 23 when he wrote the book and would only live for another four years, dying at the rock star age of 27, uh, choking on his own vomit during a bout of Carolina fever. Brown drew inspiration uh, from his novel uh, from a scandal that happened to his neighbors. He left Boston once they figured that out. And finally, when, uh, when, when Brown was working on this story, uh, he meant it as a cautionary tale about the dangers of incest. Uh, however, that did not prevent Arkansas or Alabama from joining the Union. So without further ado, um, I'm going to read an excerpt from today's book, The Power of Sympathy. The remembrance of these things fill my mind with inconceivable torture. They seem to reproach me with unmerited criminality. I deprecate, I detest all these scenes of gaiety and frivolity. Yet I have preserved my innocence and my virtue. What then have I to deprecate? What have I to detest? Alas, how have we been forming schemes of happiness and mocking our hearts with unsubstantial joys? Farewell, farewell, ye gilded scenes of imagination. How have we been deluded by visionary prospects and idly dwelt upon that happiness which was never to arrive? How fleeting have been the days that were thus employed when anticipation threw open the gates of happiness, and we vainly contemplated the approach of bliss. When we beheld in reversion the pleasures of life and fondly promised ourselves one day to participate in them. When we beheld in the magic mirror of futurity the lively group of loves that sport in the train of joy. 
We observed in transports of delight the dear delusion and saw them, as it were, in bodily form pass in review before us, as the fabled hero views the region of pre-existent spirits and beholds a race of men yet to be born. Such was our hope, but even this fairy anticipation was not irrational. We were happy in idea, nor was the reality far behind. And why is this the vision vanished? Oh, I sink, I die, when I reflect. When I find in my Harrington a brother, I am penetrated with inexpressible grief. I experience uncommon sensations. I start with horror at the idea of incest, of ruin, of perdition.